Welcome to a walkthrough of my QMIDI route 0.5.2 patch. A patch that I've been developing over a few years to try to support my synthesizers a little bit better and uh, work around some of their, their antiquated yet uh, yet important to solve bugs. <laughs> so, QMIDI route has some options. <laughs> the dash H I typed just gives you an overview and we want this one. The port count. I always like to set the port by default, it would be two. That's that's two output ports. Input it always gives you is just one. So anyway, um, we have three ports total if we run it. I haven't installed it system wide, so I'm going to run it from the path I built it in. Um, in my case, I'm using three three output ports. And here it is. By default, it sends nothing because this is checked. And we have no rules that would set it to be a matched message. So they all end up unmatched and discarded. If you uncheck this, you can have it send all the unmatched messages, which in this case would be everything since we have no rules again, to whatever port is here. So port 1. Um, now let me show you a little bit about ports. If you use a connect l you can list the ports on your system. This is a virtual port that software uses. This is a virtual port that software uses. This is my first my first USB sound card. Well, it's not really a sound card actually. This is just a um, a MIDI ports device. This is my first USB sound card, and it will be used as my input device for most of the sounds I'm recording tonight. Okay, this is a software device, which we can ignore. I'm not using it tonight. And this is the QMIDI route that we just opened. So port 129, which is also listed there, is the port QMIDI route is running at. And we want to insert it between our sound module and the program we're playing from, or the, or the hardware device we're playing from, such as a MIDI keyboard. And these are the three output ports that I created. Alright, so moving on to the next thing. Um, it can be useful to delay system exclusive messages for older hardware modules. So this lets you do that in a general form for any system exclusive message that comes in. It can be delayed right there in milliseconds. Similarly, I read in a Yamaha document that you might wish to set a delay between controller 0 and controller 32 messages, in other words, um, Yamaha's variation messages. Let me bring up that document. XGSYSIN is what it downloaded as, and uh, this is what it's actually called, the XG Format Music Data Production Recommendations. And on page 9, well, okay, first of all, so you can see, this is version 1.15. <laughs> page 9, here is where it talks about that.
you want to keep an interval of 1 over 480 between those two messages, the MSB and the LSB message, which we'll get to a little later. <laughs> All right. And 1 over 480 hasn't meant much to me because I'm thinking it's more of a musician's uh, timekeeping notation than uh, general uh, MIDI timekeeping. All right. So now to get back to that, um, the first thing I want to start with is more of a uh, more of a musician's point of view solution. I'm going to open Note to Aftertouch, which is this file. It sets up two discard unmatched events and not do any of this stuff. Oh, I never did discuss this. This is for the MT32, but I guess we'll talk about it later. All right. So, for instance, if you wanted to record something on your keyboard that uh, your keyboard didn't support, like aftertouch messages, you could record those messages after the fact with something like this. So this takes your note velocity and converts it to aftertouch, channel aftertouch in this case. And you will have to connect this program and your keyboard to your recording program. <laughs> so Let's first connect the keyboard to QMIDI Routes input. It will be, in my case, 24-1 because my keyboard is on this port. And the colon there just uh, separates the port number from the device number, I guess. So we're going to connect that to 129.0. 0. 129 is QMIDI Routes input port. So here we go. It's also written up there. Now that I've done that, I'm going to start Rose Garden. And I will open a recent file without aftertouch. <laughs> All right. This is it. It is a very simple recording of my playing badly. And I guess I could play that to show you. Um, First, I should also connect Rose Garden to my MIDI device. So, in this case, I just turned it on. And I can connect the Integra 7 to it. So that would be... Yeah. And here it is without modification. So as you can see, that was not great, but 
we'll see if we can make it a little bit different, if not better. So, first of all, I need to make sure it's a supernatural instrument, which it is. Then I need to set the effect, MFX, I guess I was on that, to Ottawa. No, yeah, Ottawa 6. Okay, then we're going to set uh, the control to after touch, which is fast as to hold shift. <laughs> okay, and then we'll get on after touch. Oh, and that should be controlling manual. Okay. It has an asterisk there to tell me that I modified the instrument. Okay. So now what I play on the keyboard should translate into the manual wah. So I will just press record and play. Well, not great, but anyway, now we can play it back without my clicking of the keys. Very nice. All right, I'm not going to save that, obviously. Now, I suppose I should prove that my keyboard wasn't playing after touch. If you look at this log file, this is what QMIDI route saw through input. Merely note ons and my keyboard, when a note is released, sends a velocity of zero, but still a note on. So that's how that became aftertouch. Um, next, I want to show you how you can edit controllers and pitch bend. So that would be Tegra 7 drawbar pitch bend. Okay. Now this one, I need to explain how this one is disabled by being sent to also port 2. Um, this one, this drawbar is being disabled also port 2, also port 2, disabled disabled, 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 <laughs> enabled, with a one there, disabled, enabled, because we're not sending, we're not connecting anything to port two. Actually, we're not connecting anything to port one right now either. So I'm going to connect 129, one, which is the output from Q MIDI route, to the Integra 7 again, 320. You can see it right there. All right. Now, I've set remove sequential duplicates here to one, which means it won't send messages 
that are exactly the same twice in a row which actually could present a problem if this was unchecked. If this was unchecked, then it would send those that are suddenly repeated as the original message. So it would be a pitch bend that would be sent. And I'd rather not have that. So let's create a new rule that sends extras to nothing. <laughs> this is why I like to have more ports available. So in this case it would be pitch bend, and it doesn't matter what I convert it to. I'll just keep it the same. But I'm sending it to port 3, which is disabled. Might as well make it 2, so it's, <laughs> so it's the same as these things. Okay. Now, we should be all connected. And for this example, I want to change the uh, instrument to... Well, pure wheel one because it's a good drawbar organ. And what it should be doing, I guess we could watch it here at the same time with a sequencer dump, HP 129.1. This is exactly the information that the Integra 7 is receiving. You can see that we've got 22 here and 24 here, 22 here and 24 here. That is because the two draw bars, that is the difference in the system exclusive message. This is the 22 message and this is the 24. They're both getting the value of the pitch bend converted to this value 0 through 8. Um, and this byte <laughs> I just let go of the wheel. Um, this is one byte. It's an indicator for uh, how we want the checksum to be generated. CKS with a 1 after it generates Roland checksums. CKS with a 2, Yamaha. CKS 3, another type which I can't remember what device it's for. But anyway, I wanted it to be very generalist and be able to support anything. Um, this notation is important. Without this, it can't, check, uh, it can't create a checksum because it doesn't know where to start adding the bytes. So here's how I've done this. These are both hexadecimals. Not that 7 matters, since it's below 16. <laughs> okay. Um, you'd count from 0. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is the start of the address. That byte right there is the start of the address on the Integra 7. Then we've got, so that's 7, 8, 9, A, B. So this byte, and this is one byte, it's the conversion from this. It's, a, it's what I call a range byte. <laughs> that is the first data byte in this message. All of this is the address for the Integra 7, and that is the first data byte. So the B tells it that. All right. So as you can see, it has type the F041100, 0, 0, 0, 64, 12, 19, 02, 
zero zero twenty four the conversion of half of the pitch bend is four from zero to eight so let's see after that is the checksum that 3d was generated purely from this <laughs> it looks more complicated than it is but i hope walking through it has helped all right so if i had been playing that you wouldn't have heard anything since this was checked now i've unchecked it and you will hear um, the effect of these system exclusive messages on the draw bars, the 16 footer and the 8 foot draw bar. And so on. It's kind of nice to be able to set that with the pitch wheel although it auto centers so there's a better way if i convert this into controller and this into controller also i shouldn't forget i want to ch change this into controller and it doesn't matter but i'll keep it consistent it'll be a controller on port 2 which is ignored anyway all right. Now, in this case, I want to fiddle with these before I do any playing. So I'm going to move this control and see that it is control 7. So I would change this to a 7 and this to a 7. This can stay the same. And likewise, this one is controller 74. So 74, 74. And those are the only two I'm working with here. So now if I tweak my controller, you can see those messages coming in. You can see their controllers here. And that's the system exclusive. So that's just the one. That's just the 8 foot draw bar. This is just the 16. Okay, and now I can play the keyboard at the same time, tweaking those independently and being able to let go of them uh, wherever I want. <laughs> Nice little example, I thought. Now for the fun stuff. Um, this trick supports the older devices. Um, so I want the MT32 file here. As you can see, we're delaying messages there. We're not zeroing the velocity, and that is the important. And that is the important thing to show you right now. This system exclusive edit is actually disabled because we're not going to be receiving an XG system on message. Um, and now I need to reconnect my devices. I suppose it doesn't hurt to leave that open, but let's go here. Well, no, it does. <laughs> I'm going to disconnect it. That is what the dash X does. We are now disconnected. Port unsubscribed. Port unsubscribed. Okay, so now I want to connect. Uh, let's just put that there first. Hey, connect 14.0, which you saw before is the through port which would be nothing, but I'm going to be, my, my music player application 
of choice, audacious, it's ready. Um, it has that port connected at all times as its output, just because I like that it doesn't change designation between boots. So we're actually going to be starting at the top here, but let's go back and connect other things. They connect 14.02, uh, the 28.0 is my sound card that the MT32s are connected to. MT32 family is connected to. It's 32. No, sorry, 28, I said. 28.0. No. <laughs> yes, I do want that, but first I want QMIDI route connected in between. So 129.0. And then let's connect 129.1 to 28.0. There we go. Hope you understood that, even though I confused it myself. Here's how I have the, them connected. The CM64 is actually plugged in directly to my UA4FX sound card. The output from that is plugged into the CM64. Then the CM64's output port, not through port, is plugged into the CM32L's input port. CM32L's output port, not through port, is connected to the MT32. And this will send the unofficial sysx that sets these two devices up into overflow assign, where dropped partials are not dropped. Instead, they're sent out the output ports. And this will be noisy because this rule is not taking place, and this rule is, and this is not checked. You're going to have stuck notes. Get ready. Oh, <laughs> silly me. I have to connect the input of the MT32s. Okay. Here goes again. I guess I should be using this other volume control. So obviously these are stuck notes. And stopping it doesn't even help on such an old device. So let's reset them. Alright. So the glitch that occurred was something that these two modules have problems with. Um, like I said, it's an unofficial overflow assign, and any note offs here, we'll open this up again. Any note offs with a velocity greater than zero, which a lot of these are, or maybe all of them, are going to end up as stuck notes when sent out the out ports. So, in other words, we're going to have to solve that. This is already in between, so all I have to do is check here, and those those higher velocity note off messages will be converted to just zero velocity messages. That's the only change. Ah, 
obviously it's much better. So, again, stopping it doesn't actually stop the old modules, so we'll turn this off with a reset. Next, we're going to try enabling this. What this one does is converts the master volume messages, which is this message, into a master volume message, which is that message, but it decreases the actual master volume value right there. So instead of being 0 to 64, or in decimal 0 to 100, it becomes 0 to 48 in decimal, or 0 to 30 in hexadecimal. All right. Um, the file I actually want to use that on is this Castle of Dr. Brain. So I'm going to leave it disabled for now. We'll leave this one on, though, because this also has that problem. And Castle of Dr. Brain coming right up. I'm going to skip past this once it loads the system exclusive. Once we get the fanfare. So, I don't know if you noticed or not on the recording, but I could definitely hear it. The uh, volume set to 100 as it is caused digital volume overflow. Because these two modules right here, well actually even, even this one was probably overflowing if it was playing through it. Um, these two modules though in particular have A different kind of overflow issue where the volume gets doubled digitally in the process and anything that actually overflowed the total storage in that digital storage causes a clicking sound when further amplified. <laughs> it wouldn't have to be further amplified, but I don't think we'd hear it otherwise. Anyway, um, so now it's time to correct that. I 
I guess I didn't finish explaining this. Now all system exclusive messages will be sent. But they will be edited with this. This also takes part volumes, that's what each one of these is, inside the parentheses. Uh, because these messages can be all on a super long system exclusive line, the parentheses dictate that multiple edits, these edits in fact, can happen to a message containing those bytes. All right, and what this actually does is it changes the part volumes of part one through uh, part eight, and possibly even the drums. I can't remember. Anyway, it changes the volumes from 0 to 64 in hexadecimal or 0 to 100 decimal into 0 to 5a hexadecimal or 0 to 90 decimal. So we've got those two volume changes. They, mo they most likely both are necessary for this loud file. Anyway, now that we have the forward mode to set to all, all system exclusive messages will be edited if they match the, uh, the initial parts. Whatever it is up to there. Yeah, up to there. Here we go. I'm going to play both files again. Just sent the system exclusive. So you can see it go to 38. And now it's at 48 instead of 100. There you have it. No digital volume overflow clipping. 
All right, so next, according to my file here, I have a GS file playing, which in this case means I want to connect my XG sound module. So With further ado, here's the MU2000. And I might as well prepare the next one too. Let's do that since it drops naturally. There we go. Okay, for this one we're going to be using, and we're not going to save this, GS for XG devices. Actually, no. I want to show you first MU2000EX to always XG with one rule here, just a rule converting system exclusive messages. This takes a, uh, let's see, this is an XG, sorry, this is a GS reset, and it converts it to an XG reset. This is a MIDI 1 reset, a GM1 reset, converts it also to an XG reset. Okay, then this is a MIDI 2, GM2 reset, also to XG reset. This is a little something I'll talk about later. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's... Let's see. I believe, yeah, I'll just talk about it later. Except to say that this asterisk means that it's matching all messages with these starting bytes. And this is just a comma with nothing after it, meaning delete all messages like that. So they will be removed. All right. And here you can see that it's letting everything else through to port one, not zeroing velocity or doing any of those things. Now we have to connect it though. Actually, I forgot to turn off the uh, Integra 7, so I'll do both of them and start this one again, because then it'll stay the same port number. All right, once again, we're connecting from my playing program Audacious to QMIDI route, and then from QMIDI route's output port 1 to 320, which is bound to be the Yamaha. Here you go. 32-0. Yep. Okay. And now what we should be looking for is missing sound effects. And note that this says XG, not GS. And silence here, silence also on channel 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Draw bar organ there on 10. Or, <laughs> yeah, draw bar organ, not even drums. And it's still playing. I haven't stopped it. <laughs>
perhaps that wasn't the best example to start with because you didn't know that that was supposed to scream, <laughs> but it was. So next I will open my other file, which does it properly. That would be the, uh, let's see, GS for XG devices. Now I've got these rules that program forward the sound effects to the proper sound effects for XG. So these are GS on this side, and it's matching based on a GS or a GM reset. And it's sending any of those to their XG counterpart sound effects. And I just called, I just gave these the proper names so I knew what was what because obviously these numbers don't tell you too much unless you're staring at the documentation. Also a useful keyboard shortcut when you want to get all the way back to here is Alt U. Anything with an underline under it can be uh, combined with the Alt key to do whatever you want. I mean this would select this port if I pressed Alt S. Anyway, Alt U gets me back to the unmatched if I'm way at the end quickly. Um, so this is the same system exclusive message as before. Um, Yeah, I did tell you I would explain this later. Um, I think these must be GS messages that I didn't want being sent to the MU2000 being an XG device, although I can't remember specifically what they did. But yeah, if we examine this, since this is the GS reset, F041042, F041042, that is, that is the Roland uh, device ID or whatever for GS. So, yeah, it's just blocking all those messages with the comma nothing. All right. And yet it is converting instruments to XG. And system exclusive messages like resets of different types to XG. All right, and again, it is not discarding unmatched events. They're going to port one. That would be for any XG files that you play. You want to play them as XG. <laughs> and of course, well, yeah. Here we go. Same, same file. And now it's Scream on all those channels, 16 through 11. And now we've got drums on channel 10. And then it turns to a laugh.
So in other words, the reason why I was converting those messages to XG is because this device actually does understand GS. <laughs> if, if you're using an older synthesizer, though, from Yamaha, I assume it wouldn't be able to understand GS resets and GS messages in general. So that is what this map was created for, GS for XG devices. All right, next. Next, if we look at this. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be sending uh, Andrew's Doom to this. Andrew's E1M1 file for the SC8850 normally, because it sets a drum on channel 3 through system exclusive. And, uh, and this won't work if you use the other file. I'll start with the other file. Again, it's like this. So it will be put into XG mode, but it won't have a drum programmed on one of these channels. Well, and on 10, actually, it's piano. You can hear that. But three would also be drums. Silence right now. And that's because it's set through GS SysX. And this never received the GS reset. So let's open the GS for XG devices. And I'll show you that, um, that specific rule for drums. It's still probably quicker to use Alt-U <laughs> and then get to the drums to XG. Okay, so this is the rule. We're taking GS drums or GM1 and 2 drums, which really wouldn't matter for the synthesizer, to <laughs> Variation, or I should say in Yamaha parlance, controller 0 is 127, is a value of 127. Controller 32 is a value of 0, but I don't think that's as important. Okay, so this 127, though, creates a drum on a Yamaha XG device. So here we go again. Jazz kit too. Sorry, I had to stop it. I think I'm running short on time. But anyway. That um, also wasn't sending the electric guitars before because I didn't have this unchecked, I guess. I don't know. Let's look. Let's look. It would have been this file. Well, I did have that unchecked. I definitely wasn't getting electric guitars. But you can see I have a jazz kit, and that's drums on channel 3 and channel 10 standard kit drums 10. So it works properly with the GS to XG I assume for older Yamaha devices the MU60 or the MU80 etc. Okay next we're going to be playing a XG file on the SC8850. Without its XG light mode. So let's see um, if I do I have that too? Yes. <laughs> 
This is the basic file, which just converts the system exclusive messages so that it never sees an XG reset. It becomes a GS reset. And this right here I found necessary to uh, not mess up some other stuff in the SC8850 that Yamaha files sometimes contain. Even though you can tell that this should mean it's a Yamaha <laughs> SysX message. The device ID being the same as the system on message device ID up here. The SC8850 does respond to it. So here I am matching anything else with a 4C and converting it to nothing. Once again, deleting those messages with the comma and a blank after it. All right, and I got to connect, physically connect it first, which this should do, and then connect it through software. Now it's connected to the SC8850 Part A. All right, and we're going to play this disco track, which is an XG file. You'll see it's not XG because you've got that arrow there. Although it's not a great example because we're looking at piano right now. But there's pick bass. <laughs> Jazz drums on 10. 11 is piano plus choir which it should not be. So I'll stop that and open the correct conversion for the SC8850, which is XG for GS devices. Now like the other one, I'm converting the sound effects to GS this time from XG. But more importantly for this file is the drums. Okay. All to you. <laughs> okay, the drums. That would be, let's see. Here it is. The rule to convert drums to GS is a little bit different. It's not just a controller value does take the controller, well, Humidity Route understands that XG resets drums are on variation 127 or MSB CC0 value 127. So I don't have to specify that here. Humidity Route is intelligent enough to realize that. It merely needs the drum forward there specified. And this is how I create, generate a GSSX message. I put a one here instead of a zero, which enables the creation of those messages. And I set this to 63 because XG actually seems to have more drums than GS. The upper limit seems to be 63 on the SC8850. So I mapped 0 to 63 to 0 to 63, then I mapped 64 to 127 to 0 to 63 again. That way I saw a, f a bit fewer <laughs> unmatched drum sets. Anyway, in this example it's not unmatched. I mean, it's not a no drum set message. So we are generating the messages there. This is a normal instrument, in which case that's an offset for a channel. And same thing. I really don't need to have these non-XG instruments set up. 
but suffice it to say I did. I did do that. This is set, so it would have set non XG stuff correctly. All right, and here is the same system exclusive edits. It's editing only XG, so non XG. GS and MIDI do not get edited. And like I said, now we're going to see a drum on channel 11. We'll start with one again, like before. Actually, that's the correct instrument now, not piano. Of course, that was jazz drums before. And actually, this is not working. For some reason. I'm just going to close it and reopen it. Sometimes it gets lost, for lack of a better word. So let's open up that same file, XG for GS devices. And reconnect. There we go. You know, I just realized what it could have, it might have been. Maybe I never ran the XG system on right here, which would have possibly never made it realize that it's XG. But let's start it over again. Still working. All right, lack of time dictates that I continue. Um, these next two I hope you enjoy. I don't think there's a whole lot of YouTube examples of the Integra 7. We're going to connect the Integra 7 again and just play some music through it that, uh, let's see, GS music with a sound effect, a scream, and this one is, uh, oh, maybe drums, maybe just, oh, no, no, no. This one just shows off the good electric guitar. <laughs> Not that you don't also get it in Vampire Killer, I don't think, but. All right. Now for this one, we need to open Tiger 7 Supernatural 1 port. This forwards the sound effects to GS, which uh, Spikey discovered and mentioned on midimusicadventures.com, the Quest Studios archive forum. Um, so this is basically using that mode that he noticed it's not documented by Roland that we know of. Um, it's using bank zero or C uh, controller 32, a value of zero, fixed value of zero. And uh, specifically the sound effect uh, for GS. Right there and there. Okay, now I'm going to go to the first tab so we can see this. We're Definitely forwarding all messages. This is converting GS reset there to looks like a GS reset there. Yep. <laughs> so it's passing that. And then it's converting a GM1 reset to 
AGS reset there, and it's converting a, uh, let's see, GS reset again to a GM2 reset. So basically, when, when it gets a GS reset, it sends a GS reset and then a GM2 reset. Okay, this one here is a GM1 reset. It's converting that to a, just a GM2 reset there. And then this one is an XG reset, and that is becoming a GS reset. All right. Um, and basically, I am using a lot of supernatural sounds because this instrument has some better sounding instruments that don't get used by standard MIDI files unless you do tweaks like this. Um, so you can see some of them has the names of the tabs. Otherwise, reading these numbers are very... <laughs> reading these numbers is, is not a uh, simple task. But anyway, suffice it to say, that's that. Now we need to reconnect to the Integra 7, which you'll see has the same port I've been using all along, 32.0 or not all along, but since I turned on the MU2000EX. Okay, um, here we go. So we're going to start playing Vampire Killer. Okay, and the final file is something I captured from the uh, an emulator actually running Akumaju Dracula X. Akumaju, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and it just has some pretty powerful guitar, which shows up really well on the Integra 7, I think. It still sounds synthetic-ish, but not bad. Here goes.
that's enough. I could also play um, this wedding cross your heart, I suppose. Hope you enjoyed the, the walkthrough and it wasn't too boring or too esoteric for you, but um, I figured might as well explain everything I could think of. There's an infinite amount that I could really go into, but it's, it's a pretty good overview with hopefully just enough information. Thanks. Bye.